I prefer the promotion relegation model only because I'm more entrepreneurial and I think it's really interesting. You can come in and, and be involved in a smaller club and add value and do some really interesting things in recruitment on and off the field and, and get promoted and, and, and get rewarded. I think the franchise model makes a lot of sense. I totally understand it. Relegation is devastating to many of these clubs from a business perspective. Um, but it's not interesting to me, you know, whether if you're in a, a franchise model league, whether you finish seventh or ninth or 11th or fifth, like it doesn't matter really at the end of the day. There's so much competition in the European style leagues to do better. It's really this kind of um, survival of the fittest, really. If you do a good job and you're a well run club and a well run business, you will have success and move up. And if you're not, you will move down. And, and so I, I generally like that model more than the, the franchise model. The VAR Show. The one place for your weekly football update. So hello, very warm welcome to VAR Show, the show which talks about all the base major football leagues in detail. Today we are going to continue the interviews and we have Mr. Jordan Gardnotus, who is the co-owner of FC Helsingor in Denmark. He's also the co-owner of Dundalk Football Club in Ireland and also has stakes in Swansea City, a lot of clubs that he's been involved with. So without wasting much time, I'd like to first thank Jordan for coming on the show. Thank you and welcome to the show. And I'd like to begin by asking you, how are you and what are you doing these days? Good. No, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, back in California. Kind of my time between uh, California and Denmark and Europe. Um, but yeah, things are good. Uh, we're seven games into our season at FC Helsinger in Denmark, which is the club that I spend the most time at. And we're five wins, two uh, two losses. So, so far, so good. So, uh, yeah, things are good. Definitely. And you know, like being in like the being the owner, like owner of a club, how uncertain has this time, you know, been during the pandemic? It's been very difficult. Um, you know, it's difficult for us to get in players into the country with quarantine restrictions. Um, obviously, we have stadium capacity restrictions where we can't have uh, more than a certain number of people in our stadium. So it's obviously been very challenging from a financial perspective. But, um, you know, every club is dealing with the same thing and we're kind of going through it and taking it one day at a time. And, uh, you know, we're fortunate that our club in Denmark, you know, as a country, Denmark has been uh, pretty good about, uh, um, you know, taking virus there's a, a you know relatively small number of cases and so uh you know fingers crossed that that continues and we're able to uh, not have any issues with that moving forward of course and i'll get back to maybe early uh, to your earlier you know like uh, career how did you like get into football and or how did the football industry happen to you did you always envision something like that yeah no it kind of happened organically um i played growing up pretty close to a professional level. I had a, another business that I had sold that was in the technology space and I wanted to get into football and was able to get involved in some clubs in the US um, and ultimately had connections with uh, you know business partners, people I knew in Europe and was able to kind of make some strategic investments and get involved in the landscape. And you know, my background is very entrepreneurial. Um, I travel a lot. Um, I'm around the world quite a bit. So uh, kind of fit in with my general um, lifestyle. And so it's, uh, yeah, it's been something I've enjoyed and um, I'm very obviously very passionate about the sport. And so, uh... and you're like, uh, you said like, uh, I think uh, the Helsingor is the one, is the club where you are more involved in, you have more hands-on approach compared to the other two. So how did that happen to you? Like, how did you plan to get into it or something? Yeah, I mean, so with the other two uh, investments, those were just kind of small strategic minority investments. I don't have any operational involvement in those two clubs. It was kind of just getting my foot in the door and getting a better understanding of what European football is about. Uh, with Helsinger, it was, you know, we felt the time was right to put together a group and buy a controlling interest of a club. And, you know, I thought Denmark was really interesting being the, the, the biggest and best league in Scandinavia. You know, almost everyone speaks English, so it was a relatively easy place for us to do business. And we felt like it was a good entry point into Europe rather than going in and buying an English Premier League club or La Liga club. Like, let's start somewhere a little bit smaller and prove that we can identify talent and install players and club efficiently and then a bigger club. And you're like, you said like you have had a you have a entrepreneurial background where you have been involved in maybe various other different, you know, like uh 
uh, world of business like we have different uh, maybe different uh, category different genre of business that are involved in how different is maybe running a football club from the other involvement that you have had uh in some ways it's similar i mean in, in you know it's it's running a small business in many ways um you know i think a lot of people see the fun and sexy part of the of the the business which is the games on the weekend but during the week it's you know dealing with payroll taxes and employees and labor laws and you know player registrations and all that kind of stuff so in many ways it's not that dissimilar from running any other business now obviously we're very forward facing so decisions we make um you know are in the local newspaper and the media um that kind of stuff so there's a lot of eyeballs on what we're doing if you have a, another business um people don't necessarily your technology business but with us you know whether we sign a player or whether we a player isn't playing or we fire a coach right all those decisions are kind of put under the microscope so it's a it's a really interesting business um in some ways similar in of course and you like like i wanted to ask you like you fc helsingor is a new club and it just got promoted to the first division i think this year so like what are your plans with the club like going forward what do you want to achieve with the club yeah i mean our goal at first was to stabilize the club you know the club had been relegated twice um and then you know we were able to stabilize the club and bring in a good manager and a good sporting staff and a good and a ceo and really um bring positive culture to the club which helped us get promoted this last season now for us it's about kind of looking up, upward can we in the next 2 to 3 years get promoted to the danish superliga you know right now we're tied for second place you know is it realistic this season maybe maybe not but um for us promotion is 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 the goal and then also it's to continue to, to develop some of our young international players from New Zealand we have a youth international player from Sweden a bunch of good young domestic players from Denmark so can we continue their development over the next 18 months and sell them on and move them on to bigger clubs and and you like I want to ask like do you think like like the maximum that you can reach with fc helsingor is being a top notch feeder club to maybe the bigger clubs in europe is that what the level is of uh, our clubs in denmark and maybe other scandinavian countries yeah i mean i, I think it depends you know, you have fc michelin who is the top team in denmark right now is in the champions league group stage uh you know fc copenhagen bromby or some pretty big clubs but You know, at the end of the day, my philosophy is unless you're PSG or Barcelona, every club is a selling club. Every club is a feeder to someone else, right? So I think we have to be realistic about our expectations. You know, for us to get to the Superliga and maybe uh, on the right day challenge for a European spot someday down the road would be amazing. But of course, there are limitations with being in a smaller club in a smaller country. Of course, and you're like you're also with uh, Dundalk, and uh, of course, you don't have like hands-on approach. Maybe you said like you are just have the you just have you know, investment in the. how did that come across how did that opportunity arise and what made you to take a take that opportunity because in no like clubs in ireland aren't very good you know like overall like it's not very famous abroad what what made you take that step i mean in general my investment thesis is to kind of look in places other people aren't looking so that's why i've invested in denmark and looked in some other places i think um you know clubs many countries have access to the europa league and champions league and i think that's one of the things that's interesting about them um in in many ways it was you know not that different than denmark in that it was just a new and interesting bit was able to kind of have that opportunity and again it's just passive i get to watch the games on tv and that's great you know all my time is spent in denmark of course i i just want to ask like that is there a law or something where you can't have two teams playing against each other owned by the same like person and if suppose hypothetically if fc helsingor goes on to reach the europa league and even dol dol play so what will be the scenario then i mean my stakes are so small and i think i believe in some of the leagues you can't have multiple ownership stakes above 10% in the same country in the same league Obviously these clubs are in different countries and they're small enough they would never play each other so it's not an issue. Okay, yeah, definitely. And you're like I want to ask like you also like involved with Swansea City like how did that come up and Swansea like they are like 
a team on the downward curve maybe right now like compared to what they were you know like few years ago so how how did that happen yeah no um i had a mutual connection who introduced me to the people related to the ownership group it's an american group and the club was in the premier league and so it was a really interesting opportunity to be involved in a big european club at that time um you know unfortunately the club has gotten relegated since but you know it's still a very well run club um with a good history and you know we were in the um the playoff last year to get promoted to the premier league so you know i think it's um it's been a really good learning experience for me i you know i haven't gone this year but in the past i've gone to quite a few games there so it's it's a fun little project and it's it's good to be a part of a big club and see kind of the, what the what the um different is those the club reacts to relegation and how it deals in a variety of different ways with recruitment and all those kind of things of course and you're like uh, out of the three investment in europe that you have right now the three one that we just talked about which one do you personally like you know like enjoy the most like being involved with yeah i mean for me that's denmark obviously i'm the chairman i'm the managing partner i spend all my time in denmark so the other two investments are fun side projects but denmark is my focus i spend all my time in denmark and so that's that's the one that's most interesting to me i i have the most mm-hmm. um ability to enact change and you know hire people and just have a you know hands on approach and you know like talking of like transfers which are integral to running a club maybe selling or even buying it depend like to run a club properly how much of it has been affected because of the pandemic um not as much as people think um you know we're not a huge club paying huge transfer fees uh, typically we're getting players on free transfers or on loan from bigger clubs but i haven't seen a huge effect from the pandemic quite yet i think you're seeing the transfer fees to press at the higher levels um but at our level I'm not seeing a huge difference honestly so also like i think in your linkedin i saw that you are also you know gearing up for your new project in maybe in the a league what what is that going on yeah no we've been looking at australia or i've been looking at australia for quite some time uh, you know there's there's challenges right now with that league dealing with um a new change in the structure of the ownership and a couple of clubs that are having financial difficulties you know we were part of an expansion bid that failed in the gold coast of australia 2 years ago so something that we're constantly looking at looking at um nothing is imminent by any stretch but um i'm definitely interested in australian football i think in the long run it, it has huge growth potential you know there's good you know definitely a good player pool that comes out of australia so i think it's something that's interesting probably not here today but in into the future Of course and you said like you like to look into places where which probably get neglected by other people what makes you like choose a country and okay I'm going to buy a club here or I'm going to invest something here what do you see Yeah I mean there has to be a good sound business structure and a lot of that comes from the revenue streams like what is the television and media rights deal look like in that country what's the track record of developing players and the domestic player pool like what's the geographic location is it an easier hard difficult place to run a business you know a place like australia for instance you know you don't have to deal with relegation uh so you're dealing with more more of a franchise model um a place like denmark ha- you know has a track record of playing young players and developing young players and it's easier to do business you know i get asked a lot you know why would i not invest in a in a team in eastern europe for instance so you know that's it's just a challenging place to do business with intrinsic corruption and difficulties with culture and language so there's just a lot of factors that go into it there's not just one thing and also like uh, like many of the places like especially the clubs which are more you know like historical or maybe which have which are more community based clubs they are very skeptical of investment from outside did you face any you know like uh, barriers like that in any of your investment that you have been involved involved with till now yeah 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 i mean you're going to see that coming in as a foreign ownership group pretty much anywhere in europe a lot of these clubs are yeah you're right community based um very local they're skeptical of kind of outsiders so you know you kind of have to come in as a foreign owner and prove yourself and prove that you know what you're doing and you can have success lucky for us and luckily for us in Denmark we've had success we got promoted so we've kind of built up a good amount of credibility locally but um you have to kind of earn the trust and i don't think a lot of foreign ownership groups understand that well enough um that takes time and energy and you can't be absent you have to spend a lot of time on the ground which is what i do so it takes time and energy and, and a real commitment Of course and you like I do not know much about the Danish league and probably you would you are well very well educated on that because you have been involved a lot with Helsingborg how is the league like uh, do you have like a supreme maybe a few clubs who continuously perform or, or win the league or something like that 
Yeah, so in the Superliga, you have uh, the big clubs are FC Michelin, uh, which is owned by the same owner, Matthew Benham, as Brentford in the championship. You have FC Copenhagen, which is generally the biggest club in the country, and Bromby. So all these are all clubs that have been in the Europa League, the Champions League. Um, they're big clubs that spend a lot of money. You know, in our division, in the first division, there's a couple clubs that have come down from the Superliga with a lot of infrastructure and big stadiums. Silkeborg, Esbjerg, those are two teams that are pretty big. Esbjerg was in the Europa League uh, two years ago. So... There's big clubs. It's the biggest um, country in terms of football in Scandinavia and the best country. It's So um, there's definitely some big clubs that some people would have heard of. Of course, and Bronby and all are very historical club. I think Daniel Agar played for Bronby. And you know, like, I wanted to ask, like, you are in the first division. Idealistically, what is the time frame that you're looking at that you would, you would like to qualify for the Super League? I think two to three years is realistic. I mean, of course, you never know. There's a lot of variables at play, but um, you know, for us, it's about stabilizing ourselves in the first division, which we've done that, and building up the infrastructure over a period of years. It, it does not happen overnight. There's definitely, like I said, some big clubs spending a lot of money in our division, but um, two to three years, I think, is realistic. Hopefully. And what is the gulf in class between maybe the Super League teams and the maybe the first division teams? I would say, uh, you know, it's like any other league. The top of the first division is pretty comparable to the bottom of the Superliga. But, of course, once you get to the top five in the Superliga, there's a pretty big gulf, the amount of money those teams are spending. So those those big clubs, it's a pretty pretty big gap there. Of course, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk of two maybe current affairs that probably you are involved with. Maybe one with uh, your FC Helsingborg and one with Swansea. The first one I'll start with Swansea was Project Big Picture, which was rejected, I think, last year week what were what was your view on it yeah i mean i don't have I, I haven't been following it super closely i don't have any involvement with that i mean obviously at the end of the day i mean the financial models in european football have to change at some clubs because of the pandemic clubs are so reliant on game day revenue that you you need some sort of solution and i don't know if that solution is a subsidy coming down from a bigger league like the premier league something has to change too much money is being spent on player wages in relation to the amount of revenue so you know, I, I I was certainly, I found it really interesting, some of the discussions about salary caps, and I realize that's much more of an American style of looking at things, but something has to change. I don't know if, if that solution is the right solution or not, but eventually something's going to have to be proposed that makes sense. Of course, and I want to ask, like, which one, like, what format do you prefer? Do you like, like, the franchise model where you don't have relegation, which you probably is the MLS type of model, or do you like relegation, which is, like, probably more European and more thrilling which one post do you personally prefer i prefer the promotion relegation model only because i'm more entrepreneurial and i think it's really interesting you can come in and and be involved in a smaller club and add value and do some really interesting things in recruitment on and off the field and, and get promoted and, and and get rewarded i think the franchise model makes a lot of sense i totally understand it relegation is devastating to many of these clubs from a business perspective um, but it's not interesting to me, you know, whether if you're in a, a franchise model league, whether you finish seventh or ninth or 11th or fifth, like it doesn't matter really at the end of the day, there's so much competition in the European style leagues to do better. It's really this kind of, um, survival of the fittest, really, if you do a good job and you're a well-run club and a well-run business, you will have success and move up. And if you're not, you will move down. And, and so I, I generally like that model more than the, the franchise model. Of course, and one more other current affairs topic that is being floated about is, you know, like European Premier League that is going around right now. And probably it does not, maybe it does not affect you currently. But, you know, like if you like plan, end of the day, everyone wants to win the Champions League, whichever team you are, you know, like playing in any division, you that's the, I think, the ultimate for any team playing in Europe. Do you think that curtails any glory that Champions League has if you have a European Premier League? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to know what the structure of a Super League would look like. I mean, to me, you have the Champions League, which basically is the European Super League. So I'm not sure. I, I know why there is the discussion. It's about capturing more television revenue and making more money, which I get it. But um, I'm not sure how that would work with a Champions League structure, how that would work. It would, would some of these clubs be completely removed from the domestic leagues? I'm not sure how that would work. So I, I don't know. Um, I, I can't really speak to it. It's kind of too early to tell. And it's a little bit speculative at this point. Yeah, no, what I meant was like, if suppose you have teams from maybe Danish League qualifying, suppose you have Bronby qualifying for the Europa League or even the Champions League. And if you have like all the major teams breaking out and forming their own league, don't you think it'll be 
disadvantage for the likes of Bromby, who probably won't be involved in that league going forward? Yeah, no, I mean, absolutely. If if the top 12 to 18 teams are not participating in those European competitions anymore, it certainly will devalue those competitions and make it more difficult for the television rights, uh, you know, to when they're renewed, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, it would make it more difficult. Yes, absolutely. And you know, like being a chairman, what is the most difficult job that you do, you know, like day to day in terms of running a club? Uh, honestly, it's managing people. It's managing, you know, putting the pieces together from our coach to our sporting director to our CEO to our technicals, like everything, making sure everything is coordinated properly because, you know, it's it's a very dynamic environment and whether it's we're going to sign a player or we're, you know, we're dealing with an injury or whatnot, it's just making sure everyone is aligned organizationally. That that definitely seems like it would be easy, but it is it is challenging depending on the day and what we're, we're, we're working on. And of course, you also said like you were involved you know like growing up playing football or soccer and that probably had an influence in your decisions to maybe make investment did you ever plan to get into coaching or playing professionally for yourself uh i thought about potentially playing professionally but ultimately i started a business and i didn't have time to do that so you know i i still play like kind of casually now so it kind of checks the box but uh no i this kind of all very much happened organically once i sold my business and um yeah, just it just kind of happened. Like things do in this in this world. And you like going forward for FC Helsingborg. What is your realistic targets that you have set out? Yeah, I mean, it's like we talked about earlier: promotion within the next two to three years, and then you know, really selling, you know, starting to sell some of our young players in the next twelve to eighteen months. I would say those two major major things are our priorities. And of course, and you like you said like how like you have to find different revenues for the European teams other than just stadium, maybe tickets, how much of the, you know, like playing behind closed doors affected uh, your overall finances? Yeah, I mean, it hurts. I would say, you know, game day revenue, whether it's tickets or, um, you know, merchandise or, you know, food and beverage is probably 30 to 40 percent of our revenue. So it definitely hurts. You know, fortunately, we do have television revenue. We have sponsorship. We have some other re revenue streams. But yes, it hurts. And we're hopeful that maybe in the new year, once things improve, we'll be able to get back to uh, opening our stadium back up. But in the meantime, there's just nothing we can do about it. The revenue is lost and we're just going to have to deal with that budget accordingly. And you're like, you said like this, like these were like small uh, investment that you wanted to do just to get your footing in the door. So in the long run, do you at least aspire to have a Premier League team under you? Yeah, I mean, I think eventually once we can continue to having success in Denmark, the goal is to do this at a bigger scale. And I'm not necessarily sure that's a Premier League team that might be a team in La Liga or Liga in France or Syria. I, I don't know what that looks like. But yeah, of course, I'm an ambitious guy and would love to be doing what we're doing at a much, much bigger club, a club that's in the Champions League, a club that has huge global visibility. Absolutely. So, you know, like, I wanted to ask you, since you have been in, you are involved in a lot of, you know, like, finances, since you're the owner of, and you have invested in many teams. So, you know, like, is playing in the Champions League more uh, financially or even globally, you know, like viable for you as an owner, investor or playing the Premier League, which is branded as one of the best leagues in the world? Uh, I think it depends on your model. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of financial benefit to both. Probably in general, I would say there's much more financial benefit to be in the English Premier League with the amount of television revenue there. You know, the, the, the challenging thing in the English Premier League is most clubs spend all that money on player wages and with agents and buying players. And so it's not really done cohesively. Um, so I think it depends what your model is, right? If you're going to go to a smaller country and you're going to be in the Europa League or Champions League, that's your model. If you're going to be in the English Premier League, obviously, and you're a mid-table team, you're really trying to maximize your you know, capturing that television revenue. So it could go either way. And personally, for you, getting back to your personal uh, you know, like choices, which is your favorite team that you like watching like of all time? Obviously, I spent a lot of time watching the clubs that I'm involved with. Um, but you know, beyond that, I like watching Chelsea now with Pulisic. Obviously, having an American at such a high level in Europe is really interesting. They play in an exciting style. Um, so I would say it's Chelsea probably. And you're like in your in your, in your uh, footballing career that you have been involved with in various aspects and various uh, cap capacities with different clubs. What is the, if you had to pick one standout moment from those, which one would that be? Uh, I would say when we got promoted this past season, 
being a part of FC Helsinger. I think, you know, even if it was from the second division to the first division in a relatively small country in Europe, just the satisfaction of getting promoted and all we put in only one, one team that got promoted out of 24. So it was very, very difficult. So um, I think that that feeling and that satisfaction of a promotion is, is just, you can't replicate that, especially in American coming from an American style sports background where that doesn't exist. Um, that was definitely something that I will never forget. And talking of promotion, like, you know, like, uh, you're all, you all promoted, which is a very good thing. And if by chance you are not promoted, how, how back would that set you as a team and as a, what philosophy that you have set out? Well, for us, we have a very sound financial model. Obviously, things are difficult right now a bit with COVID, but in general, we try not to spend beyond our means. We want to be a selling club. We want to make sure our financial models basically are aligned. So, you know, for us in three years, if we're not promoted, we'll be fine. We, we don't, we're not spending two, three, four X wages in terms of what our revenue is. So, of course, it's a priority, but it's not something that will make or break our club. Of course, Anil, like I'll ask you two final questions. And one of the, the first of the two is like, if you have to give a piece of advice to a, maybe a new investor or a new person who's just getting into football, who wants to get into football ownership, what would that be? I would say you have to have humility and under, like really talk to a lot of people, spend a lot of time on the ground, maybe do something like I'm doing, start small, make a, a small minority investment or start in a smaller country because otherwise the, the, the cultural differences and what you get into when you buy a big European football club, I don't think very many investors understand what that's all about and the pressure and the competition and how difficult things are. I think just having a good base of understanding is really, really important. I want to ask you like many, I, I've spoken to many owners and this and agents and every, and different persons related to football and this networking is very important. What is your view on it? Just in terms of the, just are agents important? No, I mean, the networking in football uh, is very important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, um, look, it's a very relationship-driven business, of course, whether it's between clubs or investors or players or agents, of course it is. I think sometimes it can be too, um, I don't know what the right word, incestuous, like too, too many people that are knowing each other too much, whether it's clubs using one agent to recruit all their players. So I, I think it's a balance. It is relationship-driven and understanding you know, whether it's an academy, whether it's a club, like how do we create relationships that are mutually beneficial on a global scale to move players and sell players and have have success, but it has to be done in a way that's beneficial for your club. And some clubs, it's just a little, it's a little bit too um, easy or too, okay, cool. I have two agents I work with, they bring us players and that's that's how I do things. And that's like, that doesn't work for me. So, you know, like, uh, like, does, does, like in your opinion, whatever experience you've had, do you think that happens like what you mentioned like some clubs you know like they only dilute certain agents because maybe they have maybe a good rapper with them yes it happens all the time i think there's some articles about arsenal deals with uh, i forget what on one of the big so that's like agent they deal with and yes i mean I, I understand from a club perspective if an agent has a pool of players and that's your access to those players but at the same time you're delegating a lot of your sporting responsibilities whether it's recruitment or um, talent identification to a third party who doesn't work for your organization. And that just is very, very, uh, sorry, very problematic to me. And I, I'm going on and on with a lot of questions. I just wanted to ask you, like, you know, like you said, like how you wanted your club to be sustainable and, you know, like not spend beyond your means because it's necessary to run a healthy club. Do you think like the football world is in a bubble, which may burst any time the finances that are being involved in the clubs are used? Do you think something like that may happen in the future? Uh, yes and no. I mean, yes, I think many clubs are spending well beyond their means. I think the, the what they have is many clubs are just backed by very, very, very wealthy ownership groups who can sustain those losses. They can sustain losses over a period of time because of COVID or because of they're spending 200 million on players and they're only getting. Um, it, in the longer term, the smaller clubs are the ones that are, are having issues, as we've seen in the UK. Um, those are the ones that don't aren't as financially stable. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, most people that own football clubs have so much money, they don't know what to do with it. And so they're able to make not very sound strategic decisions when it comes to spending and they're able to make it work. But, you know, the longer this, the restrictions with COVID go on and the stadium restrictions, the more chance that clubs will get into serious financial difficulty. Of course. So I'll stick to my word and ask you one final question here. And uh, if tomorrow you are given the choice to sign one of these two players for your club in Denmark, whom would you sign, Ronaldo or Messi? Uh, Messi. Why? I mean, I just, 
uh, you know, I, I'm not a big fan of Ronaldo's bravado. I mean, of course, he's a world class player. And, you know, I just think Messi is just a once in a generation type talent. And um, he seems from a, I'm, I'm a big fan of the mentality and the, the, the mental side of the game. And he seems to me, at least from what I've seen, that he has this drive. Um, he doesn't, you know, he's not out there on Instagram and in the media necessarily. Like, he's very focused on being the best football player in the world constantly. And, and I really like that. And if you're given a cho uh, choice between Pulisic and Messi? I mean, I love Pulisic, but clearly you have to go with Messi. I mean, Pulisic is not there yet. And you know, like, I want to ask you, like, with so many young American talents playing across Europe, do you think that is going to boom the interest that is uh, football in, uh, in the States? Yeah, I think so. I mean, we're seeing more and more Americans being in the ch playing at big clubs and being in the Champions League, and there's more and more interest in the sport. So absolutely, I think, you know, we need to translate that to our national team. You know, we didn't qualify for the last World Cup, which was pretty devastating to, I think, the sport in this country. But I think if we can see that success on the national team level, it will only continue to grow the sport in this country. Definitely. And, you know, like on that note, I won't take much of your time, Jordan. Thank you so much for talking to me. And I wish you all the best with for your future endeavors, be it with FC Helsingborg or any other club that you're involved in. And hope you can talk in soon and you can win more possible all trophies that you dream of. And take care, stay safe. Thank you once again for coming. Bye. Cool. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Player-wise, it would have to be Steven Gerrard, just because, again, before before I became a, a journalist, you know, he was, he was someone I just admired massively in terms of the absolute complete footballer. I think if you were trying to, like make a footballer in a factory he would it would be Steven Gerrard someone who you know he, I think J.D. Carragher summed it up best once when he said you know Steven Gerrard's biggest strength is he doesn't have any weaknesses. Ah the stadium uh, I, I don't see really uh, need to do that mainly um, such a, a big spending but it's true that it would be um, a fantastic stadium that's not bad but uh, you have to be careful and mainly at this moment uh, when we are going to face a very difficult time.